Oh boy, do I have something special for you today. This is a Gigabyte motherboard, but this is not just any Gigabyte motherboard. This motherboard rules the roost right now if you have a 280 watt Milan CPU. This motherboard is very special and can make quite a difference in terms of performance. It's really not something you'd think, but you probably want to see this. Alright, first up, I love Gigabyte's new packing aesthetic. Simple, clean, easy cardboard. This is a good move. Alright, so this is the MZ72-HB0. And because of California law, each one of these has a special password for the baseband management controller. So don't lose the box. Don't immediately throw the box away. Don't steal my password by trying to zoom in on the 4K video. <laughs> Look at that, it's a server motherboard. Okay, confession time. You really should probably get a bare bones chassis if you're gonna build your own server. Don't just start with a motherboard. There's a lot more that you can screw up and get wrong. The problem is that I haven't been able to buy anything remotely awesome that can deal with 280 watt Milan CPUs. But I've got this motherboard now, thanks to Gigabyte. And so we're gonna build a system. Yes, yes, I'm standing on an ESD safe mat, don't worry. This is a dual socket motherboard that's designed for ROM. That's third generation Epic. And it's designed to deal with 280 watt CPUs in a rack mount high airflow chassis configuration. I am gonna put this in a desktop case. This motherboard was built for speed. We have the 24 pin ATX power connector, two eight pin power connectors for the CPU. Yes, they both must be connected. We've got eight DIMM slots per CPU, so 16 DIMM slots on this, so we can run up to four terabytes of memory in this thing. Kind of nuts. Well, four terabytes with currently available DIMMs. We've also got a ton of X16 PCI Express 4.0 slots and a number of PCIe connections here along the board. Now at the top here, we've got three SL SAS connections, so just be aware of that in case you're you know, building a storage server or something like that. And then we've got our uh, Interface, if you've got a smart power supply that has the management bus interface or redundant power supply, you can plug that into the header as well. There are a total of six four pin fan headers on this motherboard. Additional connectivity includes an onboard RS-232 serial header. We've got a 30 pin USB five gigabit as well as a uh, you know USB 2.0 40 gigabit header at the bottom edge of the motherboard. What else you get in the box? It's not really very much. This is the installation manual, which is really just more of a diagram showing you where everything is. You know why I like this? Because this assumes that you know what you're talking about. It doesn't try to hold your hand or guide you through anything. It's just literally, these are the connectors and this is what they do. We're not gonna explain it to you because you should already know if you're this deep. If you are building a system out of this, pay special attention to the front panel header part of this diagram because the connection to the power button and the power LEDs and the hard drive LEDs will surprise you. So use that diagram to figure out which pin goes where. Again, the recommendation for a bare bones comes through here because if you buy a bare bones, it's already gonna have all that installed and basically all you gotta do is drop in your processors, memory and everything else. In terms of other accessories in the box, well, it's not very much. You get four SATA cables and the uh, rear IO shield. Now, if you've seen our other coverage up till now, you'll know that we've tested both the 7763 and the 75F3 Epic CPUs. If you're not in the loop on that, that's the 64 core CPU and the higher clocked, higher frequency 32 core CPU. And depending on what you're doing, the higher clocked but fewer cores CPU can outperform the more cores but less clocked CPU. More cores is not always more better. We've got the 75F3, and that's what I'm going to use in the system too, in fact. So that'll give us 64 cores of the highest clocked, highest density CPUs that you can get in third generation Epic, Epic Milan. 32 cores for a killer server slash workstation. It's not really a workstation exactly because we don't have onboard audio. There's not enough USB ports. Just wait for a proper workstation. But if you got a DIY it, or it's mostly server, a little bit workstation. I know you research scientists, you sit down at the console and you log in and you, you do stuff from the console on the server to do things. I, I know, I know how it is. You're not really working there eight hours a day. It's not your eight hour a day workstation, but it is a workstation that you log into both interactively and remotely. This could be a good fit for that. As long as you keep the airflow. The airflow is the trickiest thing. 
for the memory. It's not a fun time to try to be buying memory right now. It's not a fun time to be trying to buy anything. I've been trying to get a, a chassis that could properly support 280 watt uh, third generation Epic CPUs for a long time now. But I've got V-Color. V-Color I've seen at Computex. They're a huge vendor. You don't see them quite as much in America, but I was surprised that I was able to get these online for a reasonable price. So this is a half a terabyte of memory in my hand that we're going to uh, load into this thing and see how it goes. Uh, we'll test other memory to be sure, but this is DDR4 3200 CL22, uh, four gig by four, two ranks by four, 1.2 volts, PC4 25600. That's two sticks of 64 gigs per kit. And I've got four matched kits. The specific part number from V-Color is TR464G32D422K. Definitely not on the QVL list. Your mileage may vary, but it worked for me. And what desktop chariot do we have, per se, that can carry the likes of a dual 64 core, potentially 7763, 280 watt Milan CPU package combo workstation that's not a hot, loud server chassis? This is the Fractal Torrent. The internal layout and motherboard support of this particular Fractal case will support oversized bulbous motherboards like our Gigabyte motherboard here. Yes, to be sure, this is not technically a server chassis, but as the name implies, it is designed for airflow, and that is exactly what a server motherboard needs. Now, I'll just tell you right now, if you're gonna do this, the standoffs are in completely the wrong positions. You are gonna have to rearrange your, your motherboard standoffs, and if you don't, you potentially will destroy the machine. So don't not do it. It's almost completely normal that if you have a server motherboard that you're trying to use in a desktop case, that the mounting holes is gonna be a completely sketchy situation. These server motherboards really are designed for bare bones and server chassis. How many times can I say that? But the Fractal Torrent is particularly good about having almost all of the mounting holes that you need. There's eight in total for this motherboard. The one that's missed, this one right here at the front edge. There's not really a screw there for it, but you can use a plastic standoff it won't anchor the motherboard to the case, but if you press down on the motherboard, it will prevent the motherboard from, you know, flexing or bending or anything like that. Fortunately, there is no connectors in that area and it won't really hurt anything as long as you only have that one standoff that's missing. Now, eventually, if this thing stays together for a long time, I probably would custom water cool it with a custom loop using some nice SP3 TR4 CPU water blocks. You might not realize, but the physical aspects of the Epic and Threadripper socket is basically identical. So any kind of a block for Threadripper is gonna work just fine for Epic, except of course it's gonna be rotated. For now, I'm using Noctua tower coolers because, well, those will work just fine. Pro tip, with a lot of these server motherboards, if you're gonna use tower cooling, the 240 millimeter Noctua tower coolers won't fit. But you can use one 140 and one 120, or two 120s. Noctua tells me they'll work up to 280 watts, but again, high airflow, push-pull, Definitely recommended. And there we are. We've got our system fully put together. We've got the Fractal Torrent case, as well as the Ion 860 watt power supply. It's basically a 900 watt power supply. And we're letting this thing run full tilt. We've got 512 gigabytes of memory. That's eight channels per socket on this particular motherboard. Now, much to my surprise, in the BIOS, it does actually let you configure the SL SAS as PCI Express by four. So you could use those for external M.2 or, you know, devices like that. For our testing, we are using two Intel P5800X Optane drives. Now for the testing, you wouldn't think that it matters a whole lot because you've just got all this ridiculous horsepower, you don't have to think about where you plug in anything. I will caution you that it doesn't necessarily work like you expect. So we get these really awesome carrier cards. These are PCI Express 4.0. This is a PCI Express 4.0 by eight. This is basically a bifurcation card. We got two of our Intel Optane drives mounted here, each with its own dedicated by four interface. And this carrier card does happen to work at PCI Express 4.0. These are pretty much impossible to find. The lead times are, are difficult and uh, it's a little bit of an uphill battle depending on you know what, what you're looking for. But the important thing that's subtle with this is when it's hooked up, you're running both of these drives through a single CPU socket. Yeah, which PCIe slot goes to which processor can actually matter if you're running really super intense high-end diagnostics and high-end benchmarking. This is really <laughs> what we mean when we say system engineering and system architecture. 
you have to have somebody sit down and look at your software and look at how you're juggling things in order to make that determination. Take something as simple as compressing with 7-zip. Well, we've got two CPU sockets worth of memory bandwidth here. That's pushing 200 gigabytes per second plus 200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth with our DDR4 3200 V-Color modules, which I'm gonna have these in a separate review before too long, don't worry. Um, yeah, 200 gigabytes per second. You're spending all of your time moving things from one socket to the other. That's kind of wasteful. There's a lot of overhead there. You have to think about these kinds of things in system planning. How much of a difference can it make? Well, with these 75 F3s, we can be in the 99.9th percentile on open benchmarking when we look at our just simple 7-zip compression, which is mostly memory bandwidth because these CPUs are just so darn fast. It's a similar thing with FIO. When you're doing FIO testing, the flexible I.O. tester, and you've got Intel P5800X Optanes, which to be sure, Optane is in a class by itself in terms of storage efficiency, I.O. latency, IOPS. These drives in you know, artificial scenarios, these drives can push four or five million IOPS. 512 byte sectors, not real world admittedly, but real world they can easily do one, two million IOPS, random IOPS, which is just, it is just an incredible level of performance for block storage devices. And so you throw four, six, eight of those at a dual CPU complex. You gotta plan your storage a little bit. You don't want all of that storage attached to a single CPU socket because you're gonna end up creating a bottleneck somewhere and it's not really, you don't wanna do that. I mean, 10 gigabit, you're not, 10 gigabit is so low, that's only one gigabyte per second. It's a half a percent of your main memory bandwidth, so it's basically a drop in the bucket. But you start stacking up P5800Xs at eight gigabytes per second, you're really starting to talk some pretty big numbers after just having, you know, just three or four devices. And so you combine those two things. One, this motherboard is kind of the Cadillac of motherboards in terms of the performance that it offers with these higher wattage Milan CPUs. The 75F3, you can really unleash it. You can set the TDC for 300 amps in the BIOS because that's what these CPUs will run with. That's officially AMD sanctioned. And you can move the performance needle a fair bit, as you can see in our Pharonix benchmarks. When we're talking about overall performance of individual benchmarks, you know, demos like OSP rate, we're moving up almost 10% over the original May values when we really unlock what these CPUs are capable of. Things like the high performance conjugate gradient, we move from 37.05 to 43.26. And not all of that is opening up these CPUs. Some of that is platform changes and kernel changes. You know, some of the benchmarks will actually show a little bit of a regression, but that's just down to kernel version and a couple of other things. So you really gotta get in there and sort of tune your workload, and figure it out. Uh, the other thing that I'll call special attention to is the BIOS on this board. It really exposes more knobs and tunables from the AMD side than any board that I've seen before from Gigabyte or, or really pretty much anybody else. As we enter this sort of new era, you know, if it wasn't apparent before, the power budget and other sort of knobs and tunables, I want to tune this for I.O., I want to tune this for compute, you know, you kind of do need to be exposed to some of those options. We can go in here and you can do a configurable TDP. That's a pretty awesome feature on these AMD CPUs. I mean, to be sure, Intel, with some of their board partners, is trying to offer, you know, an infinite turbo boost as long as you can manage power and thermals. And that is an option that you control in the BIOS. But there are other options here in the BIOS that you can tune in order to better fit your workload. In fact, there are options in the BIOS here that actually let you pick a specific workload that you would like to optimize for, be that SQL server or transactional processing that's not an SQL server or information processing, networking, whatever. Um, you've got the tunables in here. I've, I had only previously seen this on AMD's Daytona test platform, but it's really nice to see that broken out into another platform. Further, power budget. I mean, these CPUs, 280 watts, 300 amps, that's what we're working with. This motherboard doesn't really give you a ton of PCI Express connectivity, but I feel like they've done a good job taking the power budget from not using those PCIe lanes and dump them back into the processor. So where we were you know, lighting up all of the I.O., maybe theoretically, the power is now going to the CPU side of things. And so, and so now there are more watts available for each individual core. And that's part of the reason we see the performance bump here in some scenarios. Because the software world has moved on since March of 2021, we're in August of 2021, kernel versions and compiler versions and things like that have changed. And so that has also affected the software a little bit, mostly positive, but there are some regressions. 
So stay tuned, watch this space. Got to do another video on that because it's like, oh, you pull on a thread and then thing, so on and so forth. But I wanted to give you a quick introduction to this especially good AMD Epic Milan motherboard because, hey, the supply is tight right now. I'm actually trying to get my hands on quite a few motherboards and there's just not supply. So yeah, other reviews are coming, other workloads testing. If you want to build something with this or work with me to have uh, some really awesome stuff, I'm working on a data center in a box where we're simulating a whole bunch of stuff that you would normally have in the data center to show what it would be like if you stand up this, uh, this sort of open compute stack that uh, has a clustered storage and has virtual machines and Kubernetes and blah, blah, blah. And you can run at all that on a, you know, a desktop class machine to give potential customers demos, which is really, really awesome because it's like, hey, if you can do this on a single machine, imagine what you can actually do in the data center. Epic enables that. And it really is a, it really is a changing landscape when this kind of horsepower is available for not $100,000 in a server. So it's pretty exciting times, really. I'm Wendell, this is level one. If you have any questions or demos or tests or anything like that that you want me to do, let me know. Yes, 15 million IOPS is possible on this platform and beyond. More on that later. I'm signing out and you can find me in the level one forums.